Okay, so now let's have a look at the blue body type. Um, the blue type body type tends to be the shorter on the percentile. Um, in the male, we're really looking at probably five foot six and below, and in the female, probably five foot five and below. So um, genetically, think about people from the Far East. Generally, people from the Far East tend to be on the smaller side than Europeans and Scandinavians. They are dominated by their gonads. So the coordinating, the major coordinating gland in the male is the testes and in the female is the ovaries. And both these produce the steroid hormones, which are the sex hormones. Okay? So they do produce a little bit of aldosterone, rather like the adrenal cortex. They do produce a little bit of cortisol, but it's very small. But they produce principally testosterone in the male and some estrogen in the male and the reverse, some testosterone in the female and mainly the estrogen family in the female. Okay? Now those sex hormones are also produced in the adrenal cortex and sometimes you have to, when there's an imbalance in the steroid sex hormones, you have to determine if it's in the adrenal cortex or, or the gonads. And this is one of the important things of doing the body type. Because in the body type, if you've got a green person, it's likely to be the adrenal cortex where we've got the imbalance. And if it's in the blue person, it's going to be more gonadal. Okay, so this gives you the clues. So therefore, health issues are likely to be related to those hormones. So now you're beginning to see, ah, breast problems in the females, prostate problems in the males. Okay, these are the sort of predispositions uh, that the blue people have. Progesterone is important in the synthesis of elastin. Okay, so progesterone is a hormone which is the first one produced in the uh, adrenals, in the adrenal cortex, but it's produced and released by the uh, corpus luteum during the ovulation and the second part of the cycle in the female. Now, in the first part of the cycle, the gonads, if you like, or through the egg, is not producing any progesterone. But in the second side, they are. But the blood level still has, the blood measures still progesterone in the blood. So the question is, where is that coming from? Because there's no corpus luteum being released at the moment at that particular time. So it comes from the adrenals, the adrenal cortex. So males have this as well. So what happens is our progesterone level in the male is principally from the adrenal glands. But there's a little bit en route of making testosterone from the gonads. Now, progesterone is important in the synthesis of elastin, which is the substance in the skin and the tissues, and the elastic tissues like the lung and the intestine, which gives the recoil back in. So we suspect here, uh, height-wise, how, how tall are you, Harris? Um, I'm 170. Yeah, in English. <laughs> five, I think five eight. Five eight, so he's quite tall, so he could be you see in the male here, 168. So he said 170, did you? Yeah. Yes. So he's about, he actually, th he's, he's claiming he's a bit taller in English yeah. than what he actually is. Uh, you're more like five foot six and a half, I'm afraid, five foot seven. <laughs> 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 but we, we, as men, we tend to exaggerate a little bit how tall we are and, and uh, uh, knock at least a stone off, don't we, as far as the way it's concerned. Okay, so uh, let's have a look. So if Jill tells the muscle test here, so first of all, test the muscle that he's nice and strong on the, uh, we'll use the rectus femoris here. And then we'll take the green one, I think, first as the decoy. Uh, because we know he's not a green giant from Scandinavia. Okay, and then we'll do the red one. Reds are more the, the old Celtic, you know, sort of body build. So you tend to find the more traditional European Celtic people um, are, are on the red side there. Maybe Ireland, uh, Scotland, etc. But the blues are coming in. Doesn't mean we come, blue people come from the Far East, but the Far East are predominantly blue. So now do each eye individually. So when you've got, um, some people have a, a rounder head, and blues tend to have this. Um, you sometimes they, the, s the acetate will slip off when you do it on one side or the other. Just tilt the head uh, to one side or tilt it forward so that the acetate stays there. So perfect, we've got a blue blue. Okay? Now, if you'd like to measure his rib cage, 
Uh, so what we're going to do is have a look at the rib cage here. And I think you'll find, yes, if uh, the camera there shows, quite wide, okay? Quite a wide rib cage here. Remember, in the greens, we're sort of in the middle, and the reds have the, have the narrow. And Harold, just put your hand up so that the hand faces the camera. And what you should see there, if I can spot here, just open the fingers up, can you, but, yeah, is you've got a biggish palm, okay, with shorter fingers. Now, you can't see this so well on this particular one, um, but what you find very often is the fingers are shorter. If I put my hand behind there, see the difference? It's almost missing the top digit, okay? See, I can put one digit more than you, okay? So it's almost, and they tend to taper like candles. They tend to have shorter fingers which are tapered there. So they're not great at gripping things. You know, should he swing across the trees, you know, he wouldn't be so good at that because the fingers aren't long enough. <laughs> okay. So those are the two features. So the, the hand size uh, or the finger length is shorter there, wider rib cage, shorter structure generally there. Harith is just on the tall side. We'll call him a tall blue, slightly tall blue. Okay, so the key features there, classical Eastern body shape. Men tend to be shorter, stouter, with soft musculature than the green person. Small um, hands with tapered fingers, which is up. And here we see ample body hair. Now we can see on the face, could, uh, have you got any hair on your tummy? Yes. Yes. Could we have a look? <laughs> Just only, only for the camera purposes. So you, you won't, <laughs> you, you more so up there. But you, s you see here, we've got a good head of hair here. Okay. <laughs> okay. So when you see this on a female, you'll know they're blue. <laughs> okay, a person. Like that. So they get plenty of hair. Very lucky because um, you go to senior school and you're the tough kid in the first and second year, or what is uh, what year seven and eight now, isn't it? Uh, so when you're 11, 12, uh, you're the first one as a boy to start to shave. Yes, uh, you probably could, it's a bit of a curse, probably, but you're more important than all the other boys who are, you know, all flabby and things, and you've got lots of muscle. You know, you're well, well built, really, real tough. Um, but by 13, 14, all the other boys are starting to grow taller than you, and you're getting left behind. So you're no longer the school bully or the person in charge that you looked after the class and the person shaving first. All the other boys. We're not shaving at 13, 14, but we're growing taller and taller, sometimes by an inch a week almost. You know, it's phenomenal, the growth there. Um, but what has happened is in the blue person, because they're dominated by their genes, their testosterone's kicked in. And the testosterone's kicked in too early before the epiphyseal plates have finished. They're growing, so it stops them growing. So testosterone inhibits epiphyseal growth, and the epiphyseal plates fuse over. So the poor old blue person <laughs> gets stuck at that height. They can't go on. All the other boys, you know, the reds are going up and staying there, and then the greens are going up and up and up. Um, but their willies are still small. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> when you, as you're going to a boys' school, you know that their gonads, oh dear, you know, you look at your own and it's, it's very small. See, But by 16, you're starting to go. So when you finish growing, that's when your testosterone kicks in. So don't worry about boys, you know, who are getting taller. Uh, their testosterone will kick in, but if their testosterone hasn't kicked in, they will continue to grow. So a green person will go taller, right? So the same applies in secondary sexual characteristics with a female. So with females, these are, blues tend to get on, put their breast development on and their uh, fat on the buttocks and things and get that lovely shape at an earlier age, okay? So these are the girls who mature uh, at a younger age, you know, even uh, 10 or 11. Um, but certainly by 13. <coughs> the green girls are the ones who maybe their menstrual cycle doesn't start till later on, okay? But uh, they all start in the end. So just bear in mind the body types. Now in a child, it's difficult because you don't know what a child is going to be, you know? But if you do the colors with a child and the child weakens and comes up as a blue, the chances are they're not going to be that tall, all right? They're going to be, so they can be looked after as far as their body types. If um, they show to being a green as a child, then the likelihood is they will be tall. And it's interesting because they often come in with a shorter mum. And you say, well, probably the child's taking after. How tall is your husband? Oh, he's six foot, you know. And that's more likely the child is taking after the father's genes with the, with the colour. But the blue have the shorter one, the testosterone kicks in earlier. Um, 
so they have all the features. Now, let's go through the health risks now. So blue people have a consistent physical fight with weight, okay? And the reason for this is they, they tend to get high estrogens. And the function of estrogen is to lay down fat. <coughs> you know, as we see in the female, the development of the breast and the upper body chunk and the buttocks and the thighs is where the fat distribution is. So as you can imagine, if that fat distribution increases, if it increases uh, as, the d as the estrogens tend to change, and then it's going to distribute more weight. And in a minute, when we look at the weight distribution, there's a particular weight gain according to each different type of estrogen. And we have three different estrogens, so we get three weight gains. They're sensitive to many estrogen or estrogen mimicking chemicals. Now we have 80,000 chemicals, apparently, synthetic chemicals in our environment. Synthetic meaning they're not natural ones to the body. At least 17,000 of these, 17,000 of these, are estrogen mimickers. In other words, they lock on to the same receptor sites on the cells as estrogen does. Now, estrogen has a lot of biological functions, and we've seen one of those is the distribution of fat. So in other words, if you increase the estrogen, the pseudoestrogens, the estrogen mimicking chemicals, they'll act like that and make you gain weight. Okay? And most pesticides and herbicides are estrogen mimickers. So every time you eat food, which is not organic, taste nice, etc., etc. a little bit cheaper, cut the corners here and there, you're taking in estrogen mimickers. Okay? Now, if you're a blue, this is deadly because it's going to increase your weight <coughs> and it's going to increase your risk to damaging your genes of estrogen-dependent tumours. Okay, so this is really, really important. The blue person has got to be ultra-careful of their hormones, particularly hormone-like substances. Every cancer case I've ever diagnosed, well, not diagnosed, ever, ever treated and ma nutritionally managed has weakened to blue. It does not mean blue people will get cancer, okay? This is very important. Because we're going to genetically or epigenetically help these people to not allow anything like that to occur. But if you've got a family history and you're a blue, you would be wise to follow the advice that we're about to tell you, okay? Of restricting pseudoestrogens or xenoestrogens into the diet, particularly the males because of the prostates and the females because of the breast tissue. So they're sensitive to many mim uh, mimicking chemicals which are present in pesticides, herbicides, toiletries and cosmetics. You should, as far as a female is concerned, regularly, what would you say, once every um, uh, year or two years, uh, every six months, six months or so, or every time basically you change your toiletry or cosmetic, get it tested by somebody, by a friend or a practitioner, right? Because that's probably the biggest source. Every time you put on some 15 kilograms, isn't it, of uh, chemicals on your skin per year, most of that is absorbed and most of it is estrogen mimickers. It's phenomenal the amount that goes in. Don't think it's just on the outside and it washes off. During the time that you put it on there, it's getting absorbed and the mimicker, these histogen mimickers will go through. So many of those creams and lotions, soaps, shower gels, um, which are full of pseudoestrogen-like compounds, will be absorbed into your body. And you've got to detoxify those. And if you don't and they accumulate, they'll have estrogen-like effects, which will lock on and they will stimulate the 4-hydroxy metabolism pathways, which is more a proliferative, um, which is not a good one. So have your toiletries and toilet and cosmetics regularly checked and tend to use good quality, ideally organically produced um, toiletries and have the muscle tested. This puts them at risk of developing hormone dependent tumours. Okay, so anything which plays around here, we call them gender benders. Uh, and there's nothing more alarming to a male than to put a cosmetic or toiletry in this case in a male on them and they weaken to it, okay? This is pretty disturbing, but it's not convincing. The convincing part is when they touch their testicles and get the relationship between the toiletry and their testicles, then they pack it up, okay? So you need to go for the testicles, all right? That's the only way to convince a man, okay? Doesn't matter what else you touch, but when you touch his testicles, or he touches his testicles, <laughs> and cross-checks that toiletry to that, he'll give it up immediately. Okay? One of the most common things is the sodium lauryl sulfate, which is the foaming agent in 
uh, in shaving foam. Okay? Practical, practically every man, <laughs> except those who've got beards, uses shaving foam. Every time you put shaving foam on, you're putting estrogens on, estrogen-like chemicals. Okay? Not estrogen cell, but chemicals which lock onto the same thing. Think about that. Use a shower gel, um, hand wash, whatever, which is non, you know, ideally organic, which has been muscle tested. Because that's the major cause of prostate problems, is the pseudoestrogens that are getting into us as males. Another big thing is polystyrene, cat styrene. Look at all the coffee shops that are sp the heat in those styrene mugs. Those styrene mugs are leaking styrene into the coffee, and you're taking that in, and that is a pseudoestrogen. So none of that. Take your own cup or get a, uh, a standard china cup. But don't drink out of styrene um, coffee mugs at all. Okay, so we take great care there. Um, <laughs> they are lactose intolerant. Okay? If you go to the East or you go to a Chinese restaurant, you will never get cheese served to your milk or yogurt. Okay? If you're lucky, you may get an ice cream, which they will bring in specially from a Fraser. But Chinese people are all lactose intolerant. Okay? They cannot. So once they're weaned, they don't go to the cow for their milk. They use plant-based milk. So they are all lactose intolerant. Not casein, lactose. Okay? This gives them digestive disorders. So they tend to get digestive disorders a lot if they have cow's milk. So one of the major enemies is cow's milk. Do you drink cow's milk? Uh, I try to avoid it. Try to avoid it. Now the second reason for this is that bovine insulin-like growth factor, which is a growth factor in dairy products, in the milk. Okay? It's there because the cow is actually producing the milk to get the calf to grow. But the calf is long gone and the farmer has carried on with the milking. So they're still lactating even though there's no calf to feed. It's a rich source of insulin-like growth factor. Now insulin-like growth factor from the cow, or bovine, bovine insulin-like growth factor, is identical in every way to human insulin like growth factor. <coughs> Goat and sheep milk is not. The insulin like growth factor is different. So insulin like growth factor from cow's milk will stimulate growth. It's got the growth factor in it, which is the second reason why blue people shouldn't touch dairy or lactose, right? Because it stimulates growth. It's a growth factor. Okay? Not the cause of malignancy, but we want to make sure we don't allow any of that to occur. So we want to keep the cap on the genes particularly the methyl genes, and we want to open the caps up, if you like, on our suppressor genes. So we need to increase methyl groups, methylation groups, and uh, we, we want to release the caps off our suppressor genes, which we have, to suppress tumor growth, which involves acetylation. So uh, they have difficulty in detoxifying mercury. These people must not have mercury in their teeth, okay, or any other sources of mercury. We talked briefly, I think, in the green body type, another source of mercury is tattoos. Uh, most of those that dies in there are mercury dyes, which eventually will disappear and be absorbed. Right, mercury amalgams, they must have amalgams replaced. Do them in an order that they show up by therapy localizing there. Um, but be very aware, mercury is not a good idea for blue people. They're very sensitive. Mercury is a heavy metal. Heavy meaning it's high up in the periodic table. You remove the mercury here, it does not get out the body like aluminium with the red people or nickel with the green in a matter of days. The half-life of mercury in the body is 72 days, half-life. That means 72 days, um, which is uh, going to be two and a half months, half of it will have gone in the blood and the lymph. Mercury toxicity half-life in the brain, in other words, in the fatty tissues of the body, is 27 years. So if you've got mercury in the brain, the likelihood is you'll never get rid of it if you just remove your amalgams. That's only the first, the starting process, all right? You can get rid of it if you use the right chelating herbs and spices and mixtures, which you must do. So if you've got amalgams, and unfortunately so many blue people do have a mouthful of amalgams, then you open them up, you'd be amazed what you see in there sometimes, and you think, oh no, and the patient says, oh no. <laughs> But you don't have to have them all out, you just have them out you know, as required. Most amalgams lose their size and need replacing every 10 years. 50% of a standard amalgam is mercury, the other 50% is a mixture of different alloys. A little bit of silver in there, but a lot of other alloys. When they drop out, it's because they shrunk, okay? otherwise they wouldn't drop out. 
So if they shrunk, where has the metal that's shrunk, where's it gone? You swallowed it, yes. And therefore the likelihood is there. And the li more liquid the metal, the more likely you are, and that's when the mercury goes. Unfortunately, mercury is a great filler. You know, it's a great antiseptic. Nothing lives in there. And the reason they put mercury in it is because it's antiseptic in the hole in the mouth, if you've got a dental caries. So it's a great filler, but unfortunately, the more metals you have in your mouth, the more buccal currents you develop, particularly if you have an acid pH, <coughs> the more likely you are to develop you know, mercury toxicity. In the old days, when it was just mercury, silver, and a few other ones, they were much more stable. But as they brought in different amalgams with more metals, and people gradually became more acid in their bodies because of acid rain and things, we tended to dissolve our mercury out much quicker. So blue people must watch that mercury because it's a big brain toxin. Uh, so they have poor detoxification enzyme expression for the breakdown of alcohol. Tell us about your heavy boozing days. I can't take it. He can't take it. <laughs> Isn't that a pity? Okay. From a man's point of view, always pick a blue as a girlfriend because they're cheap to take out. <laughs> couple of a couple of tonics rather than the gin, all right. Can you tolerate any alcohol? Uzo. Uzo. Okay, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, Uzo. Buzo, Uzo. Okay. Yeah, if you notice, Chinese, Japanese are not very good with it. And they've short drawn the short straw on an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. And this enzyme breaks alcohol down and turns it into aldehydes. Okay, they've got the short straw. And so they remain drunk for too long. <laughs> very cheap way. But unfortunately, what, you know, even if you don't drink alcohol, you still have alcohol in the body from the gut fermentation. So bacteria in the gut, directly you have sugar or anything that's not digested very well, and we've got natural gut flora in there, they will work, particularly the yeasty ones, and produce alcohol. So people can actually get breathalyzed. You've never touched any alcohol outside at all. You know? It's a good excuse if you do get breathalyzed. Say, you know, I've got gut dysbiosis. See what happens. <laughs> Say you learned it on a seminar from epigenetics. Okay, so um, alcohol is a not necessarily no go, but most will tell you maybe one, two drinks is fine. But that's it. You know, if they have any more, they feel uh, uh, not only tipsy, but they feel uh, bad in the morning as a result of it. Okay, um, as opposed to the greens, the greens tolerate alcohol beautifully. Okay, providing it's good, clean alcohol. Greens, we remember because of the, their chemical sensitivity, uh, are much better with spirits. Spirits are good, clean stuff. Wines are not bad, providing it doesn't have too many sulfites and other additives. Reds can drink whatever they want. <laughs> reds, uh, reds are usually fantastic. So must drink in moderation. Okay, They are sensitive to tyramine. Now, tyramine is a substance which is an oxidized tyrosine. So tyrosine is an amino acid, not an essential one, but we get it from a certain number of feds. Um, but it mainly is produced from phenylalanine. But it's an amino acid in a lot of proteins. And if it's not digested properly and absorbed, it produces, it's oxidized in the gut and to produce tyramine. So you tend to get tyramine in aging food. Okay? Now, aging food means things that are going brown. The classic is avocados. So when you cut your avocado and it's nice and green, that's lovely. But if it's going brown, it's maybe you've gone to the supermarket and you do what everybody else does and you prod your, finger, your thumb into the avocado, don't you? Okay? Along with the last dozen or so people who've also prodded it in. And that bruises the fruit nicely. So when you bread it home, you've got this big brown area in there. And if you eat that and you're blue, you'll take the tyramine, which is the oxidized tyrosine in the avocado. Another good one is bananas. Okay? For a blue person, never eat a banana that's going off. Okay? My mother um, you know, lived through the war like all our parents did at the time. And uh, you know, just to get a banana was fantastic. And if our bananas ever went brown, we could give them to mum because she would always eat them. Okay? But she used to suffer dreadfully from migraines. Okay? She used to find red wine would bring a migraine on. But she never ate avocados. They went around in those days. Um, but bananas were her favorite. And she would have them brown or almost dripping, <laughs> rather than throw them away. That was the mentality <laughs> of the wartime pain. But nothing will bring a migraine on quicker than a banana which has gone off, or tyramine foods. So tyramine is an oxidized amine, and it really, really inhibits the production of both dopamine 
uh, and serotonin, uh, or the breakdown rather of serotonin. So what happens here is they get neurological disorders, and a migraine is a typical vasodilation of the mid-meningeal artery in there, which occurs because of the tyramine inhibiting the breakdown of serotonin. So when we come on to looking at brain chemicals in a future mod module, uh, we'll see that migraine, like a lot of neurological problems, is associated with high levels of certain neurochemicals or low ones. And in this case, it's high serotonin brings it on. So bananas and uh, avocados. Chocolate is another one, unfortunately. Um, sometimes citrus fruit can bring it on. Um, sauerkraut, fermented things. They're talking about a lot of people having s um, fermented vegetables are very good for you now, but beware with the blue person that you don't get the pyramine buildup. Uh, mature cheese is another one. I've cured, so-called cured, many migraine people by just taking them off mature cheese. They love cheese, um, but it's the mature ones and the blue cheeses which are the deadly ones, because they're older. The older the cheese, the so-called more mature it is, and uh, uh, they were advising on uh, a health program I was watching the other day to eat more mature cheese because apparently the more mature cheese, the richer it is, the less you eat of it, which is why people eat mature cheese. I didn't know that. Okay. So <laughs> anyway, no, no mature cheese for you. Um, they're intolerant, generally speaking, to aspartame. Aspartame is a sweetener, artificial <laughs> sweetener, as you know, and uh, they don't detoxify. The cytochrome P450 with aspartame and MSG, monosodium glutamate, the artificial salt flavoring is not good either. So Chinese food is probably excellent for you, providing it hasn't got MSG in it. So true Chinese food is good, but cheap Chinese food with a lot of MSG and a diet cola by the side of that will be deadly. Okay, so food intolerances, dairy, but may tolerate sheep and goats products. Soya products are ideal. Soya products are not good for reds or greens particularly, but soya is an eastern grain, um, being soya bean, so you can tolerate it. Alcohol and tyramine are bad. Emotions that tend to have an unconscious emotion of not feeling loved. Okay, so they don't feel that the world loves them or their partner loves them enough. So this is their underlying uh, unconscious emotion. They need to enhance non-judgmentalism, okay, uh, in their lives. Again, we'll talk about that in other words, not being critical of other people. Aromatherapy is grapefruit. Grapefruit seems to get on very well with them, uh, but I'm a green and I react to grapefruit uh, as an aromatherapy. It makes me itch. So green people must, might find the same thing. Um, Sammy, did you find, do you, do you eat grapefruits? No. no. Okay, I think we're not very good with grapefruits. It's not citrus, it's the grapefruit, and particularly in the skin there. Um, but ri uh, blue people, grapefruits, lime, uh, patchouli, lavender, and peppermint are their lice aromatherapy oils. You know, a beautiful collection there. So let's have a look at the diet. Uh, they tend to have low stomach acid. Now, low stomach acid, acid in the stomach is for a number of reasons. One is to digest <coughs> proteins, to stimulate pepsinogen into pepsin to digest proteins. The other is as an antiseptic so you don't bring in a load of parasites and bacteria there. And the third is to ionize minerals. So we need stomach acid, but blue people don't have high stomach acid, which is why they're not good on high protein. Okay, so they're the opposite to the reds. They can eat protein, no problems, but not big. You know, a big T-bone steak is not a challenge for you. You know, smaller ones, and smaller and often. A typical Chinese meal has got different meats in it. Might you have one course there and you have a bit of a break. Uh, and then you have another one and so on. Uh, but I like my carbs more. You like your carbs more, yeah. So it's the, um, it's the protein, but in small proportions. It just sits there um, otherwise. So lower uh, animal protein particularly, but it doesn't mean they should give it up. So most vegetarians tend to be blue because they just you know, don't go with meat very much. Uh, but this does lead them to problems with B12 because they're not getting B12 in. They're natural grazers. You know, they tend to eat little and often rather than having big meals because of that. Small portions of protein spread throughout the day and organic food because of this uh, problem with pesticides and herbicides, right? So very important organic food. Vitamins, now blue people have a tendency to heart arrhythmias, 
When we studied with the phonocardiography, as we did over the last 12 months, we found the people with cardiac arrhythmias, atrial fibrillations, etc., are principally the blue people. Now, atrial fibrillation is a misfiring or an overfiring of the neurology of the heart, and blue people, or to regulate this overfiring, because people need vitamin B1, which is thiamine, and B4, which is adenine, which we find in whole grains. So for blue people, which is what we find, they need B1 and B4, or adenine. So adenine from is rich in yeast, it's rich in whole grain <coughs> cereals, uh, and another number of fruit and vegetables. So you're a B1 man, okay, you need B1. And B1 is mostly used to metabolize pyruvate at the end of glycolysis into the Krebs cycle. Really, really important to get that B1 in there. Otherwise, you end up running anaerobically instead of aerobically, so you start to get tired. They need B5, again, to cross that pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, which is B5, and they need hydroxycobalamin by the gallon, okay, because they're not getting enough in from their food because of this tendency towards uh, vegetarian, more uh, vegetarian diet. The only source of B12 is really is meat, and the real source of that is red meat uh, because it's aerobic, and the best sources of red meat are lamb, because lamb is virtually wild, because it roams across the hillsides, um, so they don't spray the fields with where, lamb, where sheep are, and because they eat more or less uh, everything. Um, wild meat, wild meat beautiful at the moment, pheasant, partridge, pigeon, hare, um, all these meats are coming in nicely, wild boar and so on at the moment, getting coming back into popularity. Good time, you can buy them up relatively cheaply because this is the season for it in January, and they freeze very well, very good source. If you don't have wild meat, everybody should really have wild meat um, at least once a week. So that's the best sources of B12. On the minerals, boron, again, to help good strong bones and regulate, particularly in women postmenopausally, the estrogens. Magnesium, selenium, again, for... Uh, glutathione peroxidase, enzyme, and uh, thyroid. Sulfur, for building up good strong joints and collagen. And zinc, <coughs> like everybody seems to need zinc for DNA repair. Um, on the oils, interestingly, it's predominantly the omega-3 oils that you need, more than the six. So blue people need much more of the flax seed oil, pumpkin seed oil, walnuts. Flax is basically 60% uh, omega-3 alpha linoleic acid. Maybe we could include chia oil here, is 70% omega-3. Uh, maybe some black cumin seed oil here would be very good as well. Pumpkin and walnut are about 10% omega. So lovely oils, there's a mixture of what we call the blue mix here. Uh, they're very good and very excellent for blue people. But again, notice, don't cook with them. Okay, very important. You can cook with any oil, but not those. Okay, because your body incorporates it. Good. Herbs, basil, coriander. Now, coriander herb, because this is under herbs, is the green coriander, which you use with fish and other dishes there. Great, otherwise, um, um, uh, you can use a great detoxifier, particularly of metals, and that's maybe the, the, the part with, uh, with mercury. So it's a very, very good one as far as uh, detoxifying metals. Dill, again, fish. You see all these herbs are traditionally used more with fish. On the spice side, it's the hot boys. The chili, the cinnamon, and the paprika. Do you like spices? Yes. Blue people tend to like spices. It, it makes them feel good. Okay. So the hotter they are, the better. Just bring it up. Weight gain is always due to excess. Now, this is a different than a lot of hormones. Um, with the red people, we're looking at weight gain with the decrease of the thyroid hormones. With the adrenals, it's weight gain from increasing the adrenal hormone output particularly the aldosterone with the weight gain there. But the estrogens, again, is the increase in the estrogens, not the decrease. Okay, so when estrogens go up, you get more fat dis dis uh, deposition, because that's what estrogen does. It deposits fat. Now, there are three estrogens called E1, E2, and E3. And these are known as estrone, estradiol, and estriol. So estrone is the principal <coughs> estrogen postmenopausally in the woman. Tends to go for the middle areas in the uterus and receptor, all the receptor sites there. But where it likes to put the weight is the buttocks and the thighs. 
So above that, you get the normal shape, and then all of a sudden, shoop, I'm here. So that shape, which is called colloquially the pear shape, is due to high estrogen. Okay. Estro uh, estrone. Now, estradiol, which is the principal hormone premenopausal, puts it on generally all over in the secondary sexual characteristic fat distribution. So the breasts get larger, generally the waist gets a bit, bit wider, and the hips and the buttocks. But it's a general overall weight gain. This, of course, applies in the males as well, but generally it's in the females that we see this with the weight gain up. Now, the third one, E3, is called estriol, which is the principal estrogen in pregnancy. It targets the lower uterus and the vagina postmenopausally, and this puts it on, like the pregnancy, on the tummy. So you get the apple shape. And this is where the main weight gain with the male is. So the male gains the weight here. Very rarely do males gain weight here. We don't have the estrone. Relatively rarely do we gain weight. Some people gain weight all over, which would be estriol. Um, but the biggest danger is the apple shape, is the estriol, or E3, with the male side. So here in the booklet, we've got E1, which is estron, E2, and E3, and the male. So I think that completes the blue uh, constitutional body type.